the topic on deep resilience. Mindfulness practice to help us survive and thrive in challenging times. Sister Kathleen Chu is one of Southeast Asia's pioneering trainers of mindfulness for corporate contexts. Kathleen draws on her 20 years of corporate experience of using mindfulness practices for sustainable resilience in disruptive environments. She focuses on stress resilience, sustainable peak performance and optimized teamwork. Kathleen is a certified by the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute, US, and has facilitated workshops in Hong Kong, Tokyo, and Malaysia for diverse audiences ranging from startup teams to executive coaches at multinational corporates like Pricewaterhouse and uh, Petronas. So let us uh, pass it over to Sister Kathleen for her sharing. Over to you, Kathleen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Brother Bobby. Um, so I hope everyone had a good uh, night's rest last night and had a good Saturday yesterday. Let me just get my share screen on for you and we can start. Are my sound levels okay, Brother Bobby? Yeah, very good. Very good. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. So welcome everyone to um, the session. Uh, just before we begin, a quick note on optimizing your learning. So if you can, uh, here are five points and the first and the last are the most important. For the duration of this session, if you can give your relaxed and full attention to the session, um, because we'll be working with the tool of attention and relaxation. So if you have a lot of distractions coming in, that um, won't be optimal for you. So if you can, uh, turn off your social media just for now and handphones as well. Um, fast video connection would be helpful if you have, but if not, then no worries. Uh, individual access uh, also helps um, if you want a little bit more privacy. Mutual confidentiality. Um, I'll be asking for comments and feedback as we go along in the chat box. So it's best if we can agree not to share what's outside what's shared here today um, so that people can feel free to ask questions. And try to give yourself a distraction-free zone so that you can work with the tools of relaxation and attention. Um, some of the, because we're working with the tool of attention and awareness, some of the practices that we're going to try out today can be very invigorating and energizing for some people. And for some people, they can find them a bit um, demanding. So if you find that you're not feeling so comfortable at any one moment, feel free to take a step back and rest and join in whenever you can. Okay, so... Essentially, as I mentioned, we'll be working with practicing greater awareness. Um, and that is the key tool and skill for today. We'll have a few practices 
throughout, short, short practices that you can easily integrate into your daily life to bring a touch of mindfulness and calm into this crazy, hectic world. So introductions, Brother Bobby has kindly introduced me already. So very happy to be here with everyone today. Um, feel free if you would like to, uh, to drop your name and what you would like to look forward to get out from today's session into your chat boxes. And I will monitor the questions if any come in and reply to you accordingly. Okay. So let's begin with basic breath awareness. I'm going to invite everyone to stretch, stretch yourself out, relax, and trying. what we're going to do now is we're going to find a comfortable and relaxed posture for ourselves so that we can start to work with um, awareness of the breath. So to do that, the first thing is we're going to stretch yourself as much as you can, feeling your joints moving away from each other in any direction that you feel comfortable to. Opening the shoulder blades, the neck, and wiggling your spine. Okay. Now, I can't see anyone on my screen because we're telecasting to Facebook, so I'm going to assume that everyone is okay. And if you have any um, questions or difficulties, please drop them into the chat box. Okay. Now, just try and uh, find yourself a comfortable posture where you can sit where you feel relaxed, yet alert. And then we're going to sort of focus our attention into the breath. We are going to do a very basic breath awareness. Um, I don't know how many of the people present here today already have prior experience with mindfulness and breath awareness, but I'm going to do this as if there are people as well who've not tried it out. So we'll take it from right from the beginning Settle yourself in your posture, anything that is comfortable for you. Relax. And slowly draw your attention to your breathing. Just put aside everything else that you need to focus your attention on. Bring all your attention to rest on the process of breath. Filling your lungs, we're going to take three deep breaths, maximum capacity, expanding your lungs as much as you can. And then releasing all the air from your lungs as much as you can. Again, inhaling as much as you can. Exhaling as much as you can. And don't worry, do that on your own time. Filling your lungs as full as you can. and releasing. And now very gently, resting your attention on the breath in a gentle way, allowing the breath to just be natural. Let the breath breathe itself however it wants to breathe. And all you're going to do is just to watch the breath going into the nostrils, the breath going out of the nostrils. I'll leave you a little bit of space and silence now so that you can bring your attention and awareness to rest on the process of the breath, feeling the energetic quality of the oxygen flowing into the body. And the relaxing and releasing quality of the breath when you let it go out of the lungs. Okay, gradually 
bringing your attention back to your surroundings and the room where you are. On your last couple of breaths, getting ready to open your eyes whenever you feel comfortable to do so. Hello and welcome back. Okay. Hello and welcome back. Hopefully, okay, I will try to speak louder. I've got some feedback that some people can't hear that well. Um, hello and welcome back. Uh, now we'll have some comments. Please feedback in your chat boxes how that was how that experience was for you. Uh, any feedback on how you felt doing this practice? Were you able to feel and experience the breath? Whether you felt your attention was distracted? Anything at all that came up for you? Okay. Feel free to drop that into the chat box as we progress to the next slide. So in this practice, what we're trying to do is develop the ability to hold a quality of attention that is open and spacious, relaxed yet alert. Allowing the attention and awareness to rest on the breath in a relaxed way. Allowing ourselves to be familiar with a quality of attention that is not tense, but relaxed. That's the first building block of working with attention and awareness in mindfulness. For those of you who are able to uh, dip into that, welcome to it. I hope you enjoyed that. And for anyone who had uh, difficulty, don't worry. There'll be more of these practices sprinkled throughout the talk today. So you'll get some more chances. Now I'm going to invite this question. When you hear resilience, what comes to mind for you? Um, feel free to drop that also into your chat box. It's good to have a common understanding or at least to check in with, I'd like to check in with everyone to make sure that we're on the same page with the idea of resilience. Quite often what comes up um, is people think of being able to bounce back from setbacks or to be able to recover from um, challenges in life. So today, with deep resilience, we are going to talk about how we can create the conditions for personal success through deepening emotional resilience, gaining practical skills and strategies for overcoming challenges through the practices of mindfulness that will allow us to access joy and cultivate success. This one hour and a half session is um, a shorter version of a two day workshop that I'm delivering in 2021. And the four pillars of the content are deep joy and resilience, developing inner calm, deep connection and dealing with pain and failure. These are four key aspects that give us deep resilience. Today, we'll basically focus on the first introductory part, deep joy, and its relationship to resilience, and briefly touch on how deep connection empowers that. So we'll now get into another opportunity to practice a mindful breath. Settling yourselves um, in your comfortable, alert yet relaxed posture. Taking your breath into the body and letting the breath out. Just relaxing into your breath. What we're going to do is to put aside anything else you might have on your mind at the moment. For this moment, you have nothing to do. Nowhere to go. This is a holiday. Don't worry. If you have worries, tell them they can come back because this is only a very short one breath practice. They can come back to you later. So you may close your eyes or keep them open. And you'll take a slow, relaxed, deep breath. For the duration of that breath, rest your attention on the process of the breath in a gentle way. This will be total and gentle attention on feeling your breath, and that is all. 
Now, if you prefer a more specific instruction, you can bring attention to the feeling either in your nose or in the body as you breathe. Ready? Breathing in. And breathing out. Now on your own time. And when you're ready, open your eyes and return your attention back to the room. Hello and welcome back. I hope that people were able to taste a little bit of um, mindfulness there or, or relaxation. Conscious relaxation is the quality that we're after. Okay. My chat box has gone on holiday along with the breath holiday. I cannot get it to come back. So I will, if you do have comments, do continue to put them in and I'll address them later. Um, I do have two comments that were, e questions that were emailed into me earlier on. One is how to attain ease and joy on demand. Um, and that was what we just did is the first building block of the practices that will allow us to do um, have this ability to attain ease and joy on demand. Even within one breath, the key is training the mind's ability to enter this state by getting used to it, experiencing it, and allowing it to sink into the fiber of our being. So I invite you to, to try that as we progress for the rest of today. I have another question, which is what practices can build resilience uh, from Joanna? So today's practices hopefully will be able to bring you the realizations that you need, the emotional states that you need to create resilience, a deep well of resilience that you can draw on when you need it in challenging times. The key with that is they do need to be practiced a little bit every day so that they are there for you. If you try to do these practices for the first time in the middle of challenge, it can be difficult to sustain the feeling of calm attention. So for today, give yourself this one hour holiday to practice calm attention. Right. Um, so comments and questions. We'll now um, try to practice one joyful breath and that is the next step up so you've done one um, mindful breath now we're going to take a practice of inclining the mind inclining your emotions towards the emotions of joy and we're going to see if we can taste a little bit of joy in amidst the calm and stillness of one mindful breath to prepare yourself for this allow yourself to just be happy, give yourself permission to be happy, to be joyful. Some people can find it easier if you bring up a visualization of a happy memory, someone when someone made you happy. Um, or when you were in your childhood and you had a happy memory. So inclining the mind towards that emotion and then combining that with the one breath practice. Strengthening your ability to practice one joyful breath at any time in your day, in amidst challenges, can, can bring you um, access to just that little bit of extra resilience when you're facing difficulties. So this is an important step in the process of building deep resilience. Settle yourselves and we'll give this one a shot now. So put aside, again, anything else you might have on your mind. If it's very early in the morning for you, you can also tense up your entire body. Just tighten your entire body as tight as you can. Breathe in and let it all go. Relax, just soften everything and relax. Softening everything and relaxing is a great way to bring some relaxation into the body. 
to dispel hidden tensions. So now, you may again close your eyes or keep them open and prepare to take your one deep, slow breath. And for the duration of that breath, you'll be giving your attention only to your breath in a gentle and relaxed but focused way. As you breathe in, imagine breathing in joy, happiness. Give yourself permission to smile. And if you don't feel like smiling, that's perfectly all right. And when you exhale, feel all negative tensions being dispelled from the body. I'll give you a moment's silence to practice that on your own. Okay, whenever you're ready, return your attention back to the room and gently open your eyes. Welcome back to the session. So, feedback and comments on how that practice went for everyone, um, please put it into the chat box so that I can address any questions that come up for you. So today we'll be speaking about deep resilience, the role of happiness in resilience. First of all, um, I'd like to introduce you to the idea of these three words and the relationship between them. Now, what do you think is the relationship between these? For myself, I used to believe that I needed resilience so that I would be successful, so that I could deal with failures and be successful, and that would bring me happiness. So that was my, that was my conditioning for a large part of my life. However, this model that we're going to speak about today is about developing a happiness that is independent of everything else. And that happiness gives deep resilience, which then leads to success. This model um, is proven by, this model was put forward and proven by the research of Professor Sean Aker. And he found that happiness was a greater predictor of job success than, uh, than academic success. So in his studies, which he did at Harvard, he found that as a predictor of job success, IQ did pretty badly. Only 25% of job success was predicted by one's IQ and academic qualifications. Meanwhile, 75% of job success was predicted by a person's happiness based on their optimism levels, their social, um, the health of their social relationships, and a positive attitude to stress. These being the key factors of um, intrinsic happiness. The references are in the bottom if you would like to look them up. What else about happiness is useful to know before we launch into the rest of this talk? Happiness actually delivers 19% greater accuracy on tasks. So doctors who are happy make their, diagnos their um, patient diagnosis almost 20% more accurately and quicker than doctors who are not happy. Um, his other research found that employees are 31% more productive when they're happy than when they're not. And salespeople outperform, happy salespeople outperform um, other salespeople by 40%. So happiness isn't just a feel-good factor, it has concrete economic benefits. In addition, being in a state of happiness turns on all the learning centers in your brain and releases dopamine into your system. One of the positive 
positive, uh, very positive emotional states. In his 2011 Harvard Business Review article, Professor Sean Aker published that the greatest advantage in the modern economy is a happy and engaged workforce. So on some level, we all know this. And on some level, our HR departments all know this. But on another level, I have a deep suspicion that many of us go into work every day feeling relatively happy given that it's an unhappy situation. Feeling that this is good enough given that I'd rather be somewhere else doing something else. That's not really happiness. Um, the kind of happiness that we're talking about is the kind of happiness where you might have a colleague at work who seems to really enjoy what they're doing all the time. Um, regardless, of, regardless of what else is going on in their lives or regardless of um, how, how stressful the work is. Yes, no, that is a bit of a rarity these days. Um, it, that is one of the reasons that people decide to come out and start their own, own practices or businesses doing something that they love rather than being employed. And that is one route to happiness. But today we're going to talk about developing happiness within ourselves, independent of external conditions, that will give us that resilience to be more successful in our daily lives. Professor Sean Aker's research um, came out of looking at the outliers, people who were performing better than expected, um, given uh, given the constraints that they might be under or given an existing level of resources. So instead of looking at the normal distribution where everybody, how everybody else was performing, he looked at people who fell outside the expected curve and he discovered that they had um, a different mindset. They had a mindset of facing challenges, uh, seeing stress as a challenge and an opportunity to improve rather than as see seeing stress as a threat. They had a happy and positive outlook in terms of when they were stressed and facing challenges, they didn't withdraw into themselves. They maintained uh, contact with their social relationships and networks. And um, that gave them a greater amount of mental health to deal with challenges. So in today's practices, we'll also be looking at how we can a very short practice of how we can improve the health of our social networks based on our attitude and outlook. Um, I still am not able to get my chat box back online. So forgive me if I'm not taking questions. Uh, I can't see them. Essentially, um, back to Sean Aker's research anyway. Essentially, the pattern he uncovered was that people at Harvard that he was studying, he would have expected them to be very happy given that they had made it into Harvard and they were at the world's top university and they were, you know, the cream of the, the, the elite of the world. But in fact, the greatest proportion of them were very unhappy people. Um, every success that they had only led to greater, a greater need for um, resilience and no happiness. This, this, uh, this, this example that he gave of um, achieving success and never reaching happiness really resonated with me. He calls it um, expectation shifting the goalposts of success. Um, and I apologize to the cartoonist who originally drew this because I have recaptioned it. It was um, originally a COVID cartoon saying that um, moving the goalposts. But I use it here to, to, show, uh, to kind of illustrate how. With every success that we achieve, if we believe that success brings happiness, we never have time to enjoy happiness because at every success that we achieve, the next success, the pressure of the need to get another success is so high that we can't stop and relax. We have to start gearing up for the next um, grueling challenge that's going to come our way. For example, let's say 
the Harvard graduates, as soon as they get into, into Harvard, they have the challenges of doing well and getting to Dean's List. And of course, not everyone can get into Dean's List. And that is one of the secrets of the world. No matter how successful you've been before, there's always going to be a challenge that you cannot succeed at. So if your happiness depends on that, then you will not find happiness. And without happiness, our resilience tends to run low very, very quickly. <clears throat> um, where am I going with all this? I'm going with this idea that the old paradigm of building resilience in order to get to happiness needs to be reversed because there's a big U-turn with every success. So let's say in the case of the Harvard students, they've made it through first year, they've made it through second year, they've done their final exams. Can they now relax that they're actually going to get graduated from Harvard? No, because then they have, even before the final results come out, they have to prepare for grueling internship interviews. And then at the grueling internship interviews, if they make it through those, they then have to, um, perform like crazy on the internship to try to land the job. And once they land the job, there's no time to be happy or celebrate that success. Because the next thing is, why haven't you made partner in this firm yet? That is the pattern that tends to become ingrained if we follow the idea that resilience leads to success, leads to happiness. However, if we can develop a happiness, that is independent, then we don't get caught in this vicious cycle where every success demands even greater resilience and just keeps wearing us down. So that life starts to look a little bit like this. Without an intrinsic well of happiness within ourselves that we can call on, on demand, we'll burn out quite quickly. So how? do we talk about this new paradigm? Let's start by defining what is happiness. What do people think happiness is? I really need to get my chat box to come back online. So just give me a moment and hopefully people can drop some questions in while you're waiting for me to try to get my chat box. Oh, okay, my chat box has come back from holiday. Welcome back, chat box. Um, very early on, I have a comment from Jeanette. Resilience means you can stay sane in an insane world. Yes, thank you. Um, and from Li Hui Hui, relax. But Oh, okay, so this was the comments that came in from the breath exercise. Relax, but monkey mind slips in after a while. Yes, thank you, Li Hui Hui. Liu Hui Hui. I apologize if I don't get the pronunciation right. The great thing about the one breath practice is that the monkey mind um, isn't... It, it, if you're trying to do a 20-minute um, meditation practice, the monkey mind has a lot of space to come in and interrupt you. If you are doing a one breath, it's much easier. So it's a really easy uh, version of mindfulness. It's a quick, small bite, little drops, little sips, better than nothing. And it kind of prepares your mind for longer ones when you want to do longer ones. So hopefully today's micro little bite practices will help you with your monkey mind. And Gary Fu says resilience equals persistence. Yes, resilience equals persistence. Without persistence, it's very hard to succeed at anything. The problem with resilience is, of course, that pink screen flat battery. How often do we feel? We recharge our phones every night. We charge our phones every time they start to run low. But our own batteries, we just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Sometimes we just don't recharge. So today's practices of deep resilience, they're all about how to recharge very quickly. So we're doing speed recharge, USB 4.0 um, quick charge. And we're also learning how to increase our battery capacities. So thank you very much for the comments. What is happiness? What is this happiness thing that we're talking about that's going to give us deep resilience? Okay. Um, we'll have a quick look at what Matthew Ricard says. And Matthew Ricard, why we're going to look at what he says is he has been scientifically recorded 
and um, acclaimed as the world's happiest man, possibly because he's one of the few um, high level Buddhist masters who has been scientifically tested uh, and measured in terms of um, brain scans. Um, he went through a whole lab process um, with Professor uh, Richard Davison to a certain what was going on in his mind and his brain and his body when he was meditating. And his happiness levels measured in those tests were completely off all the charts, uh, higher than all previously known levels of happiness. So being a meditation master, he has some, I think, authority in terms of um, his, the clarity of his definitions. So we can look to him to see what he says. He says that happiness is a deep sense of flourishing that arises from an exceptionally healthy mind, not a mere pleasurable feeling, fleeting emotion or mood, but an optimal state of being. So that's the definition of happiness that we're after in terms of generating deep resilience, not just fleeting emotion, but a healthy mind, a state of being. Right. How do we get there? That's all very well for the happiest man in the world to say, what about the rest of us? I will now take us on a very quick technical tour of the causes of happiness, because I think that that helps us. If we can understand what causes happiness, we put ourselves in a much better position to generate our own happiness. Don't you think? Here we are. This is Professor Paul Dolan, uh, who is another internationally acclaimed happiness expert, but in a different field. He's not a Buddhist meditator. He is a behavioral economist um, by profession, and he became interested in studying people's happiness. And he came up with, uh, after a lot of research and studying lots and lots and lots of people over decades, um, he, just, he came up with this very elegant equation that says that people's happiness is made up of experiences of pleasure and purpose over time. So experiences of pleasure do give us happiness and, and a sense of purpose also gives us happiness. He chose these two because he found that some people were more driven by pleasure and some people were more driven by purpose, but basically everybody fell into these two groups. And I think his definition that says experiences, uh, when, he called, when he mentions that it's your experience of the pleasure and your experience of the purpose, that is important because these things exist in our lives and sometimes we don't experience them. So it's important to actually experience pleasure and purpose in our lives. Don't worry too much about that um, over time thing. That just means from the time you were born until the time that you're no longer here. Um, and the references, his book is up in the picture. You can look for it if you, if you find him interesting later on. I would like to compare his analysis of what makes people happy with uh, what Professor Martin Seligman says. Now, Professor Martin Seligman is another international expert, but from the field of positive psychology. He was the father of positive psychology, the first psychologist to step up, one of the first psychologists to step up and say, the study of psychology is broken. We are only looking at sick people, um, people who have mental trouble, mental disease. Why doesn't psychology look at what makes people happy? And so in that aspect, he's one of the revolutionaries in his field. And his model of well-being and happiness has five components, the five axes. Positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. So according to Professor Martin Seligman, when you have these five things in your life, you'll be very happy. Notice that um, positive emotion roughly correlates to the idea of pleasure in um, Paul Dolan's model. And accomplishment, meaning, and engagement closely correlate to the idea of having purpose in life. So the one aspect that is a little bit different in terms of happiness is he mentions relationships, which is very important, healthy relationships. Um, so we'll be looking at practices today to build our happiness, to build the two foundations of happiness within ourselves. 
how do we um, experience greater pleasure and purpose in our lives? And how do we have healthier, happier relationships? The practices of mindfulness are useful for this because they allow us to develop self-awareness. Having self-awareness allows us to design our lives, um, direct our lives, know when we are experiencing pleasure, knowing what gives us a sense of purpose, and then derive happiness. Paul Dolan speaks about this importance of self-awareness in this, in this way, he says. He met up with a very close friend for lunch one day and spoke to her about her work and she was full of stories about her work she couldn't stop telling him about how stressful her work was how impossible the deadlines were how horrible her colleagues were how difficult her boss was how 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 absolutely miserable she felt that particular day at work and most of the days at work so paul asked her well if you're so unhappy at work, why don't you quit and find a new job? To which his friend replied, Are you crazy? I love my job at MediaCorp. So this story is directly from his book. And he calls it um, the snapshot view of happiness versus the video or the movie of your life. Self-awareness helps you to be more aware of what's going on with the movie of your life, as opposed to just dropping in for the snapshot you know how snapshots are like posts, so everything looks perfect? So when we have a snapshot view of happiness, it's not surprising that we might not have a lot of it in some of the activities that we engage in every day. So mindfulness helps you develop self-awareness over the long term. And over the short term, mindfulness allows you to experience pleasure and purpose right in the moment where you are. So let's talk about relationships now. How are the practices that we're going to see today going to help us with our relationships? Well, the practices of mindfulness also help us to build greater social awareness, as well as to enjoy our relationships more. And we'll see how in just a minute. Da -da -da -dum, spoiler coming up soon. Having all these in our lives will give us resilience. And now we're going to talk about how we're going to actually develop that happiness for ourselves. The practices we'll look at are um, all very short, very bite-sized, very practical things that you can drop into your daily life. Um, and also a practice for relationships, very quick, very short, that you can drop into your daily lives. These practices work, they are very powerful but you do have to do them at least once a day and maybe a few times a day. But the good news is they only take one breath. So you don't, have, you don't even have to make 10 minutes. There are days, honestly, when I cannot find 10 minutes in my day. But so far, no matter how crazy things have got for me, I can always find one breath somewhere in the day, even a few one breaths somewhere in the day. And that's why I think that these are very powerful practices and that they work, bringing us the resilience to thrive. Um, just before I go into the next slide, I'm going to try to get my chat box to check in because it keeps going on holiday. All right. Okay. So if anyone has any questions so far or any feedback, please feel free to drop them in. We'll now have a look at one more happiness expert or rather mindfulness expert. Um, this is Professor Rick Hansen, psychologist and positive neuroplasticity expert. We're looking at these experts from different fields and what they say about the practice of mindfulness and the practice of happiness. Notice I say the practice of happiness as if happiness is something that we can practice and get good at. That is one of the central ideas. Looking at happiness in this new way as something that we can practice and get good at. And what, what is the insight that Professor Rick Hansen has for us? So at his TED talk, Professor Rick Hansen spoke about enjoying your experiences. 
good experiences, allowing yourself to sink into your good experiences and really allowing them to become part of your psychology. He mentioned um, in this talk, among other things, but this was the core important thing for the practices that we'll be doing today. If you have experiences of happiness in your life, but you don't allow them to be experienced, they don't leave an impression on you. They don't become a part of you. And you become less and less likely to notice when there is something happy in your life. So the tiny bite-sized practices that we have today are for a chance for you to really sink into and experience the states, experience these emotions, which become so pushed out by the busyness in our lives that we've pretty much forgotten how to have them. Why, it's ex why is it important to look at happiness as a skill rather than as an external factor? We'll come back to Professor Sean Aker's research, which what predicts long-term happiness? What did Professor Sean discover? He found that in actual concrete research, the predictor of happiness, if he knew everything about your external environment, your wealth levels, your affluence, how comfortable your home was, whether you pass your exam, he can only predict 10% of how happy you are. Me so what's happening with the other 90%? 90% of how happy people are is actually predicted by how they process the external world. Now this, this is pretty, pretty mind-blowing because what this is, is this ties in perfectly with what we learn in Dharma about happiness not being dependent on external conditions. 10% of your happiness comes from your external environment, the people around you, what they say or do, the job you have. 90% comes from how you think about all these things, how you receive them and how you process them. Your happiness is not dependent upon external conditions. So how do we then change our minds and the way we process the external world in a way that is natural, not forced, part of us and comfortable for us. When you do the practice of a joyful breath, you're doing what, um, you're doing what uh, Professor Rick Hansen spoke about in terms of experiencing the emotional states, allowing them to permeate your mind and your body and allowing yourself to sink into that feeling of happiness. Now, if that is difficult for you, then it probably means, possibly probably means that you haven't been paying attention to, to a relaxed sensation of happiness very much. Possibly because like me for much of your life, maybe like me for much of your life, every time you had a success or a happiness, you kind of um, pushed it aside and said, okay, I'll look at that later when I have time. I don't have time. I'm too busy. I have to work on the next thing. So eventually we forget how to feel happiness and that wears us down. We run out of resilience. So the practice of one joyful breath, if you take nothing else away from this session, take away the practice of one joyful breath. If you were able to experience the state of calm and joy, just file that away for future reference so that you can come back to it when you need it. If you want, you can give it another shot. We're going to try now a step up from one joyful breath. This one is called high intensity interval training. And it is inspired by something written by Chad Ming Tan in his book, uh, Joy on Demand, which I highly recommend, highly, highly recommend. He spoke about how meditation is like training for the mind, similar as how exercise is training for your physical body. So meditation is training yourself for mental fitness, mental performance, <coughs> mental performance and mental fitness in your daily life in the same way that exercise trains your cardio, trains your strength so that you can face challenges better. How do we apply that? 
he spoke about being inspired by um, how Professor Jamie Timmons um, came up with this high intensity interval training discovery when he put someone on an exercise bike and got them to pedal at high intensity for 20 seconds, rest, 20 seconds, rest, and 20 seconds, and then rest. That's a total of one minute of intense exercise a day, just one minute. So the revolutionary thing that Professor Timmons found was that one minute of high intensity exercise was equivalent in terms of physical after effects uh, measured by VO2 max, um, the amount of oxygen that your body can utilize, equivalent to 20 minutes pedaling on a bicycle um, the same number of times a week. So that is what Chad Ming Tan spoke about. And he likens that to having a very intense mental practice. So the intensity of the practice, the intensity of your mindfulness. So we're going to try that out, doing 20 seconds of really intense attention and then resting so that the monkeys in the monkey mind, you know, they can't complain. You're only doing it for 20 seconds. They can leave you alone. 20 seconds is only about a couple of deep breaths. So I'll lead you through a guided version of this in a little while when I, um, but basically what we're going to do is the mindfulness version of physical high intensity interval training, HIIT. What we're going to do is we'll start off with one gentle breath. And then after that, you will have 20 seconds where you intensely but gently, intensely but gently pay attention to your breath, entering the lungs and exiting the lungs. You will be making that attention so intense that you don't practically even hear or see or anything else outside that. Just all your attention will be on the breath, but only for 20 seconds at a time. After that 20 seconds, rest. Just allow the mind to wander and do whatever it wants. And then 20 seconds again. The key thing to remember when you're doing this is you want the breath, to, you want your attention on the breath to be gentle. If you have to choose between gentle and intense, go with gentle. Okay, so now settle yourselves in a comfortable, relaxed posture. Alert, but relaxed. Closing your eyes if that helps you. Leaving them open, but keeping your focus just in front of you if you like your eyes open. And very gently, collecting all your attention so that you can rest all your attention on the breath. Breathing in, breathing out. Just let it be. Going back to where you were with the breath holiday before. All your attention just for the breath, just for now. Noticing the breath going in and the breath going out. And I will tell you when the 20 seconds start. For now, just relax, just relax. And starting now, intense attention only on the breath. And now relax. 20 seconds has passed. Give yourself a break. Just relax your attention. Gentle attention. Relax your attention to the sounds around you. And 
and prepare yourself again for 20 seconds intense attention, relaxing your attention entirely onto the breath. And relaxing your attention to the environment around you, the sounds, the feeling of your body, wherever your attention wants to go. Let it go. Just be aware where it's going. And preparing yourself again, getting ready for very intense and gentle attention to rest fully on the process of the breath. Now. and relaxing your attention just to your body and the surroundings. Let your attention go wherever it wants to. Just be aware where it's going. And however that went for you, just enjoying the last couple of breaths. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. <sighs> As you prepare to return your attention to the room where you are and the session with everyone else and gently opening your eyes if you had them closed. Welcome back from high intensity interval training. Please let me know how that went for you. Um, and my chat box is back from its holiday. So I have a post dated comment from Jeanette. Happiness is brutally honest feeling of contentment, less desire. Wonderful definition. I, I really like that definition. Thank you, Jeanette. Yes. Um, Contentment is a key word and less desire. Happiness coming from ourselves, a sustainable source of happiness. If it's going to be sustainable, then it has to come from contentment with less desire. Dun, 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 dun. What comes next and how we get there? Well, we've already started getting there. I would love to hear back from people how the practices are going for you. Any questions you have, very important to have questions about practice. Um, either if it's going well or if it's not quite going well, um, whatever it is, please let me know. Feedback is also important for me to um, see how to uh, go on with the next practice that's coming up. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, next slide. Let's take a look at what Chad Ming Tan says in his book, Joy on Demand. We have been working with one joyful breath, experiencing one joyful breath. Joy, according to Chad Ming Tan, very clear definition he has, joy is a building block of happiness. So while joy is not exactly um, the greater mental contentment state um, of uh, which Matthew Ricard spoke about, where he spoke about how happiness is actually a deep sense of wellness that comes from a very healthy mind. So joy is a building block of happiness. If we can train our minds, train our ability to access joy on demand, 
as the title of his book says, then we are building up our house of happiness. This is a, an analogy that my first meditation teachers like to use a lot. Every practice is like a brick. You're building a house. Um, I suppose a refuge for when you need it. So every practice, whether it's a good practice or a bad practice on that day, each breath is a building block of happiness. So let's continue and see what we're doing with inclining towards joy. We are developing a toolkit, an ability for experiencing happiness independent of our external situations. We are creating an ability within our brains, within our cells, within our minds to move our mood, to move our overall average each day. Every day we will feel negative effect and positive effect. Frustration, sadness, despair, depression, anger on the extreme end, neutral, calm, peaceful equilibrium in the middle, and positive effect. Things that give us joy, things that give us happiness, things that bring contentment and satisfaction. The end goal of the end game of the practices is giving ourselves the ability to shift our average, our overall average at the end of the day to have more positive effect. The two ways we're doing that is bringing joy into our lives by bringing in one joyful breath, bringing in that experience of joy. The second way we're doing it is experiencing and enjoying that sensation of joy, strengthening our ability to notice when something is joyful and expanding our ability to enjoy it. Comments and questions, um, drop into the chat box. So what I personally feel with the one breath practices is it's like sipping from a recharge fountain throughout my day. It's just one breath, but it's a sip of joy that recharges me. So no matter how bad my day gets or how tired I am, knowing that I can take one breath and kind of sip from that fountain of joy that, that exists there. That, that is a factor in knowing that I have the resilience to bounce back. The more you do these practices, the faster you get at accessing the state of joy. Um, so conventional battery charging versus quick charge 2.0. If you can sip from the fountain of joy once every hour, you're going to really build up your capacity. That's why these practices are very powerful. As you do them, you will discover that you recharge faster. Practicing this ability to access calm or access contentment just from one breath allows you to reset your system so that you have... Um, we spoke about how resilience is the ability to bounce back. So. Another thing that Chad Ming Tan spoke about in his book is that tennis pros who play Grand Slams have the ability to bounce back within one breath. So apparently a friend once told him that tennis players at the highest level is not a physical game, it's a mental game because they're all physically so good and so strong. The ability to actually win a Grand Slam depends on a tennis player's ability to completely reset his mind and his emotional state just between one point and another point. That's about the space of one or two breaths. So with the one and two, one or two breaths, they are able to completely let go of any negativity or feeling of disappointment from the last point and reset for the next point. And that's how they win Grand Slams. That's exactly the practices that we're doing with the one breath practice. We are training ourselves to have the ability to reset to access a place of calm or even joy, just in one breath. I've been using this practice for about a year now on top of um, other meditation practices that other teachers teach. And I have found that on days when I'm just so exhausted and I feel like I can't go on, if I can remember just to take that one breath, 
and access that place of joy, it just helps me to keep a little bit more on an even keel. So, we are now going to explore the practice of the happiness ray gun. And this is the other super short practice that you can do throughout your day. Highly recommended to do this every day. Um, it's really easy to do. Let me just check in the chat box because I, I suspect we have some chats coming. Brother Sui Hyang says, enjoy the moment of happiness once we, ourselves once we feel it. Thank you. Yes. Um, Min Lee says, drowsiness sets in within the 20 seconds. How to keep the awareness going? Mm. Min Lee, thank you for this question. Um, drowsiness is a very, very common uh, complaint in our sleep-deprived society. Ajahn Brahm says that we are one of the most sleep-deprived generations. Um, he says, if you're very drowsy, every time you practice, um, go get some sleep. If that's not possible for you, I know times when it hasn't been possible for me, don't fight it. Um, allow it to be. The intention to do the practice is in itself already very beneficial. If the drowsiness comes, maybe not every time, because sometimes you do want to get the practice in, but it's okay to just be drowsy and just practice through the drowsiness if you really can't fight it. Fighting it will make you tense and frustrated, and that's the opposite of what we want to be. So um, that's fine. Drowsiness is fine. If you're really tired, it's natural. Try to find a time when you have a bit more energy to do the practices because when you do the practices, you are laying in the groundwork so that the next time you do them, they're easier. And the easier they get, the less tired you will be from doing them. So that can also help with drowsiness. The 20 seconds is intense. So drowsiness within the 20 seconds is a little bit like if you have ever tried to do HIIT with a trainer and the trainer says, it's only 20 seconds, come on, pump your knees higher, higher to your chest and your muscles are burning. That's kind of the equivalent maybe of the drowsiness in the 20 seconds. So don't worry, um, try again next time. You, you, you may not feel so drowsy next time. It's just your mental um, muscles saying that they've never done this before. Okay. Liao Hui Hui, hit is good. Yes, thank you. Jeanette, uh, agree on happiness not dependent on external condition. I experienced that. Thank you, Jeanette. I do experience that too, um, on and off. However, my goal is to hopefully experience that more and more often. Thank you for the comment. Um, Jeanette says, what is the difference of happiness and joyful? Uh, we may have, th this may have come in before uh, the Chad Min Tan slide. So joy being the building blocks, one of the building blocks of happiness. The experience of joy as one of the building blocks of happiness. Happiness being a deep state of contentment and mental health. Sui Hyang Po says, Brother Sui Hyang says, I was taught to take breaths as they are. Now I learn to practice intensely. Is this a deliberate effort? Yes, this is different. So um, taking breaths as they are is very important for practicing letting go, letting be, and gentle awareness. Um, heat, high intensity practice, is important for strengthening your concentration. Although concentration is not in vogue now, ever since Ajahn Brahm said this is not concentration camp. Um, you, it's also useful to practice intensity. Uh, and the analogy that Chad Ming Tan uses when he talks about this is the Tibetan masters talk about meditation as a perfume in a very, very small bottle. If a very, very intense perfume is kept in a small bottle and the cork is opened and then shut again, because the perfume is so intense, the scent lingers on in the room for a long time as opposed to a weak perfume that only lasts when you spray it and then it's gone. So the beauty or the value of intensity in practice is it also helps the after effects to linger on longer. 
remembering to keep in mind that uh, he has a very strong caution. If you have to choose intensity and gentleness, always choose gentleness. If you have to choose between intensity and gentleness, always choose gentleness of attention. But do try out the intensity. It becomes easier as you go along. Uh, another question by Sis Jeanette. Am I right to understand that resilience is achieved by using the one breath method to reset our mindsets to keep us going? Yes, that is one of the things. So um, when you need to reset your baseline, if you can remember to do the one breath and if you've been practicing doing that one breath, just within that one or two breaths, you can actually reduce your heart rate, reduce your stress levels, change the stress chemistry that's flowing in your in your entire body system to something that's a little bit calmer, a little bit more positive, that gives you that little bit more resilience to continue. So yes, Sis Jeanette, the, res the, the resilience is achieved by using one breath. However, over the long term, doing these practices over the long term also leads to greater reserves of resilience. So it, it works on multiple fronts, which is why this is really powerful stuff even though it's really short and really easy. It works on multiple aspects and angles. Brother Jason Lowe says, during relaxed moment, do we only observe surrounding or observe the thoughts? Thank you for this question. Um, you can do either one. The most important thing is to be aware where your attention is. So there is this thing, um, attention, and then there is meta attention, which is attention to attention. How they explain this is, let's say, so let's say I wave my hand over here and you're aware that I'm waving my hand and I'm still speaking. And then I, I also wave my hand over here. You're aware that your attention shifted, even though you're still paying attention over here. That's what they call meta attention, an awareness of where your attention is. Another way to think about it is, um, let's say I am aware that my mood is not so good today. Having, paying attention to the feeling of my mood is paying attention to the feeling of my mood. That's attention by itself. Having awareness that I've noticed what my mood is, is meta attention. So um, to answer your question, Brother Jason, the most important thing during relaxed moment is whether you're observing your surroundings or whether you're observing the thoughts, knowing that you're observing the surroundings or knowing that you're observing the thoughts. Why that's important is because meta attention is the faculty that guides our life. Meta attention is the faculty that helps us to make better decisions in the middle of heated situations and awareness of where our attention is. Um, we can go into that more later if, I, if you need more clarification, but thank you for that question. L Chan, I Chan, sorry, the screen is not very clear. I think it's L. L Chan says, happiness to many is the form of monetary sense. They would say no money, no happiness, and forever never happy as keeping chasing money throughout their lives. My thoughts, yes. Happiness, um, very, very, very good point. Just a quick note on the time, because I do want to get to the happiness ray gun for everyone, but this is a very important question, so I will go on and answer this. Um, Money, a basic minimum amount of money is definitely conducive to basic, <clears throat> basic health, basic happiness. So you know that um, in school, you may have seen the pyramid hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs pyramid. Give me one second. My hierarchy of needs right now is I'm thirsty. So right at the bottom of the hierarchy of needs, food, water, shelter, basic, basic needs. When those needs are met, then we can start thinking about other things like um, when, when those needs are not met, 
it's it's going to be pretty difficult for the average person to practice pursuing happiness. It's not to say it can't be done, but um, and Buddhist masters and the Buddha story himself is proof that it can be done. But for the general person, uh, in those conditions, it's difficult for us to learn and practice the skills to have happiness. <clears throat> so most of us, when we reach the top of our upper level of the pyramid, self-actualization, when our basic needs, food, shelter, uh, relationships, care, love, these, these are the needs that move up the pyramid. So as we move up the pyramid, um, we come to this point called self-actualization. And usually when we have our basic needs met, we can start looking at how having enough resources to practice how to have happiness. At that point, if we don't practice how to have happiness, then we keep chasing um, the basic needs as if they were going to bring us happiness, then it doesn't work anymore. Um, I think the idea is economists had come up with this. Uh, I don't have the graph with me, so it's I'm going to have to try to do it with my hands. There's, there is a graph that economists have come up with that show that they have actually measured people's happiness based on how much money they earn. And that's quite interesting because they find that after a certain income level, up to a certain income level, below, below a certain income level, people's happiness increases with the amount of money they get. After a certain income level, people's happiness stops increasing with the amount of money that, they, that, that comes in. So there is a kind of, a, generally speaking, a minimum amount of necessary um, wealth, basic needs that need to be taken care of. But at that point, we need to be able to readjust our minds <clears throat> to train for happiness coming from other sources. Um, so I hope that helps to answer your question. That is my, um, I will actually, I think I would like to do, in future, I may do another topic, another talk with the graph specifically on this, because this is a big topic as well. Sis Shannon, Sister Sen Shannon Kam says, assuming there's no pleasant event during challenging phase, how to find positivity to instill happiness and still practice heat? Hi, hi, um, Sis Shannon, I, can you clarify for me, if you can, assuming there's no event during, pleasant event during challenging phase. I'm not quite sure what you mean by challenging phase. Do you mean within the meditation? Or do you mean um, in your daily life? So I'll come back to that when I get some clarification. Uh, unfortunately, I can't quite figure out. Let me try again. Assuming there is no pleasant event during challenging phase, how to find positivity to instill happiness and still practice it. Oh, okay. I think Sis Shannon means um, during the 20 second intervals, uh, it was difficult to access joy. Um, okay, in, in that case, don't worry because look, it's the first time that this concept is, is, being, is, is being brought to your mind. It's the first time you're trying to actually do it. So if you weren't able to access joy during HIT, don't worry yet. Um, just keep that concept of HIT aside for now, come back to it and just go with one joyful breath. Just go with one joyful breath. If you can't go with one joyful breath, just go with one mindful breath. Just to be, just to enjoy the feeling of, oh, I just breathe one breath. I don't have to do anything else. No responsibilities, nothing to do. Just want to look at the breath going in and the breath going out. When I do that, sometimes if I have difficulty and it doesn't feel pleasant, then I imagine that my breath is like the waves on the seashore. Like when you're on holiday and you go to the seaside and you sit and you look and you've got nothing to do and the wave goes up the shore, down the shore. So you can't go to the seaside, but you can breathe. So your breath is like the wave. You just watch the breath. And that's enough.
So if you do that often enough, then it becomes easier to access the joy and then hit becomes easier as well. So I think that hopefully that helps address Sis Shannon. Hi, Eng Yu. Many are too focused on material wealth to, ex to, to the extent that they forget spiritual happiness. How do we strike a balance in spiritual happiness and worldly happiness? Great question. Um, similar material to Brother Al Chan. I, I have to move on in the interest of time uh, to get to the happiness ray gun, but I will try to come back to this question later. Thank you, um, Brother Hai Eng. Okay, the happiness ray gun. So if you remember, earlier on I mentioned, um, I mentioned that we were going to do two key pillars of the practice, uh, one which was the joyful access to joy, experiencing joy and allowing it to sink into us. And the other one is, oh, thank you for the feedback. My share screen has disappeared. I will bring it back. Okay, great. I think it's on, just let me check. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Thank you all for your patience. Okay, great. Okay, so um, the happiness ray gun is the second pillar of joy for resilience. And this, this may also help with Sis Shannon's uh, question about how to access happiness. Um, so for this practice, this is what, again, from Chan Ming Tan's book, this, this one is entirely taken from Chan Ming Tan's book. You are going to Imagine two people, since we can't see each other's screens, our faces, imagine two people hold their faces in front of you and you are going to wish them happy and well with as, with as much focus and intensity as you feel comfortable doing. But basically, um, I'll guide you through it and then I'll leave you in a little bit of silence to try it out. And what you're going to do is you're going to settle yourself in your position, relaxed and alert. Breathing in and breathing out. Coming into the state of conscious awareness, conscious relaxation. Thank you for practicing this with me. We'll now start the instructions. Okay. So bring to mind, in your comfortable, relaxed state, the face of one person who you regularly see, you're familiar with, or even a stranger if the face is familiar enough for you. Now, as you breathe in and out, you're going to say to yourself, I wish silently and secretly I wish for this person to be happy. I wish for this person to be happy. And now bring to mind the second person. I wish for this person to be happy. So now, silently to yourself, you can continue to wish, I wish for this person to be happy. I wish for that person to be happy. If you like, you can pretend that you are firing a happiness ray gun at that person. And in your mind, you can make sound effects, pew, 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 as you shoot them with happiness. And if it sounds silly, I'm not making it up. It's actually in the book. Now, if the joy of loving kindness arises, Bring full attention to it until it fades away. 
If it fades away, rest the mind. Okay. Now we're going to do this in a cycle. Now that you've had a chance to try it out with the guided. We'll do this in minutes. So for one minute. Visualize two people randomly in your mind and allow a wish to arise. Say to this person silently and secretly, I wish for you to be happy. I wish for you to be happy. And to the other person, I wish for you to be happy. For one minute, just wishing them happiness with loving kindness. And I'll tell you when the minute is up. And if happiness or joy arises, resting your attention on the experience of the joy of loving kindness. Okay, bringing your attention back to your room and to the session with everyone else. Gently opening your eyes. Welcome back, everyone. So comments, feedback, questions on how this practice was for you, please drop them into the chat box. Um, I think I may have taken a little bit long answering questions just now, so I'm going to try to get through the rest of the slides rapidly. Um, and continue to drop your feedback into the question box and I'll attend, I'll, I'll, pay it, um, I'll answer them if there's time. Okay, what's happening with the pra practice of the happiness ray gun? So we spoke about Matthew Ricard before and how compassion and, and his, his um, experience showed that scientifically measured compassion was the happiest mental state ever measured in the history of neuroscience. So what's going on there? The concept that I used to have of compassion was that there was a lot of sadness involved, but apparently that's not quite how it works when you practice it at a high level. When you get to high levels of practice, compassion is actually a very happy state of being. And a lot of that comes from the joy of loving kindness. The joy of loving kindness is a kind of gateway, gateway drug, if you like to call it that. It's a gateway step to the joy of compassion, which is even greater. People who practice um, the happiness ray gun have reported that their entire day at work um, has lifted because they started practicing it at the beginning of their day wishing two random colleagues, just that tiny little one practice. So I um, encourage you to take that as a take home and try that out and see how that helps. The neuroscience behind this is that as human beings, we are the most social creatures on the planet. We live together in a lot of stress, yes, but actually in a lot of harmony compared with um, how the rest of uh, the animals actually live. We don't necessarily get into fights and tear each other's throats out on a daily basis. Um, okay, that was a really violent image. I apologize for bringing that in. <laughs> but basically, we coexist very peacefully um, most of the time, even if we don't pay attention to that. Our news is full of violent reports and bad news, but 
ninety percent of the time we're actually the most peaceful, the most um, the most able to get along with each other species on the planet. And our brains are hardwired for social behavior. So when we put ourselves in a state of compassion, uh, of feeling, wishing well for those around us, it's actually very healthy for our entire biological system because that's how humans were meant to be. We, we operate on such a deeply collaborative basis that we cannot survive without each other. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll just leave that. And if you have questions, I'll take that later. We'll talk about what's going on in your physiology, in your biochemistry, when you experience uh, compassion and loving kindness. Compassion and loving kindness are also referred to as sublime states um, in Chan Ming Tan's book. And what happens when you experience the emotions involved in sublime states is there is an activation of the vagus nerve it's a phenomenon known as neurocardiac coupling, an activation of the nervous system um, in the brain and around the heart. Guess what? The sublime states, if you were able to experience the joy of loving kindness and pay attention to how your body felt, you would um, have an insight into why activation of these states has been scientifically shown, and the research is in the, in the tiny print in the bottom, to improve heart health, um, strengthen recovery of heart patients after surgery, people who have these, who've done these practices. It, it um, leads to resilience to stress, increased resilience to stress, richer relationships, and trust building. People with strong vagal nerve um, activation have been shown to be more readily trusted by other people. So although you're doing these practices in your own body, there is an impact on your relationships and the quality of relationships. So again, this is a really, really powerful practice because it works on so many fronts. First, it's giving you access to calm or joy, whichever is fine. It's giving you... Um, it's building up your resilience banks. It's enlarging your capacity for resilience. And it's also going to affect your um, social relationships in the long run. And richer social relationships in the long run is great for resilience. So it's a positive cycle. So don't look down on these practices just because they're short. They are very powerful. And, oops, skip too fast, come back to the other slide. I am mindful that I have gone five minutes over time, so I apologize. If people need to leave because they have commitments, prior commitments, please, um, I apologize and feel free to do so. <clears throat> For those who would like to stay on, this next bit is basically, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, we're done with the practices. So the take-home practices, your take-home work, we've already covered. This is the science and explanation of why they work. So while you're doing these practices, if they felt difficult for you um, because it's the first time you're trying them out, don't worry. It's like the first time that you're doing a, a new machine at the gym. It's going to feel weird. But if you do them again and again, you're building up the neural pathways in your brain that enable you to do them more easily. Just like how when you work on a particular um, muscle at the gym, the next time that you do it, it's easier. It doesn't feel so like kaku anymore. It feels, it feels much more natural. So as you do these practices, not only are you building up your neural networks in your brain to enable you to access these things more quickly, on demand, but you're also starting to build these positive neural, um, the neural connection to support positive positivity, happiness and optimism in your brain. So overall, that's over the long run going to lead to greater capacity to perceive happiness and enjoyment in your daily life. 
And guess what? Having that capacity is going to give you greater resilience. How this works is if you're going through a forest for the first time, there isn't a pathway, so it's tough going. And eventually, if you keep walking the same way through that forest, a small path will start to appear. Neural pathways kind of work that way as well. So this is an analogy. And the more you use them, the more you strengthen them, you end up with something a little bit less like a difficult forest that you have to fight your way through and something a little bit more like a highway that it's easy and fast to go along. So that leads to greater capacity for resilience. You've built your capacity as you do these practices. Great. I've managed to cover the slides only five minutes late. The practices we've covered today are one mindful breath, one joyful breath, high intensity interval training, and pew, 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 the loving kindness ray gun. So um, questions, please, uh, questions, issues, difficulties, feedback, positive experiences that you had, please feel free to drop into the chat box. I will take a quick look at the chat box and then I'll talk about what we learned today. Chat box. Chat box is back from holiday. Tan Pekswan says, Sister Pekswan says, joyfulness comes first before happiness. Correct me if I'm wrong. Ah, great. Um, it can, but it's not set in stone. Joyfulness can come, joyfulness can be a component of happiness. Happiness can also come from other sources besides joy. Happiness can also come from contentment. Happiness can also come from generosity. Uh, happiness can also just come from practicing well pleasure and delight in practicing meditation well. So there are many sources of happiness that don't rely on external conditions. And the happiness also of knowing that we have access to happiness when we need it is also a powerful source. So thank you for that clarification question, Sis Pixwan. Hai Ing Yu says, worrying and fear of death, especially for those who are terminally ill, affects the attitudes towards living now and hinders them from achieving happiness when seeking it how do we guide them to live now with compassion ah okay this is a great question um i would strongly uh recommend that it's actually very difficult to counsel um others and to teach them these practices the best thing you can do is to practice these practices now yourself while you're healthy and you have the energy to do so. Start to build those neural pathways in your brain now while you have the capacity to do so. Because when the challenges come, when you're ill and dying, you're more likely to be so worried and so exhausted that you're going to find it difficult to practice. That's not to say that it's impossible, there are stories of cases, people who have done it, people who have sudden breakthroughs because they're at the end of their line and there's nowhere else for them to go. So it does happen. But that's um, slim chances. So this is insurance. You want to um, maximize your coverage. Start practicing now. Build these contented neural states into your brain now so that they are there for you when you need them. <clears throat> applies also to elders. Uh, it can be quite difficult to talk to old people. The thing that I'm trying very hard to do with my practice now, <coughs> excuse me, I, I just recovered from a sore throat. Excuse me. Apologize for that. <coughs> so um, the thing that the best thing you can do with these practices when dealing with other people who can't seem to access happiness in their lives which I'm working very hard at remembering to do in my own life, is to take that one joyful breath in between talking to them. Um, it can be very difficult to persuade them to see things differently. They, don't, they haven't built the neural pathways and they haven't heard the Dhamma, then it can be really hard. Even for people who have heard the Dhamma and have been practicing, um, it, it, is, it, it helps so much 
but it doesn't mean that we become Buddha overnight. So the best thing that we can do is to, um, in my in the longer version of this of this talk, in the two, in the two day version, I will talk about um, being the rainbow in someone's cloud, and that's how you apply these practices to yourself to try to lessen the burden that others are feeling. Um, that is often the best thing we can do. So I hope that helps. The best way we can guide them to live now with compassion is for ourselves to live now with compassion and hopefully set by example. Thank you for that question and I hope it helps you. So to recap, today we covered Oh, okay. <clears throat> Today's session was very fruitful and productive. You learned two secrets, one power and two abilities. You learned the secret of contentment um, to get an easy, authentic and sustainable source of happiness and joy. You learned the secret of change, neuroplasticity, how you actually wire these things into your brain so that it becomes natural and not forced. You learned the power of intention. Oh, I didn't go, I didn't have too much time to go into that, but basically, if you have the intention, even if that practice on a particular day, you don't feel like you managed to give it as much intensity as you would have liked, the sheer intention of sitting down to do that practice or the sheer intention of saying, I would like to achieve this is already programming your neural pathways in a positive way. And with the knowledge of these tools, you have gained the ability to design your happiness using self-awareness of what makes you happy in life and turbocharging your happiness using the happiness ray gun. The joy of loving kindness for people is a very powerful joy that you can use to turbocharge your own access to joy. Okay, so that uh, pretty much wraps up today. Any further comments and questions, please feel free to email me at livehappier.me at gmail.com um, and if you want to stay on and ask the questions in the chat box I think BGF is going to uh, give me a very stern warning because I've gone 15 minutes over time now um, I did have one question that I promised to get to which was how to be mindful to be proactive in pandemic times it's a very big question um, this is from Brother Sweeham. And how to, how to come, I had another, another question that I did promise to answer over email, which was consistency, how to um, compose yourself immediately when the need arises. As you do these practices daily, and as you set the power of intention, you will be able to more and more compose yourself when the need arises. When you catch yourself using your meta awareness, when you notice yourself not being able to um, compose yourself immediately when the need arose, you can set the intention in your mind for the next time and visualize a situation for the next time. Visualization is like, um, it's like a flight simulator. You visualize a difficult situation before it comes and then you stop yourself and you practice um, loving kindness, or composure, or equilibrium, or calm, or practice a better response. Then when the real situation comes, you improve your chances of more consistently responding in an optimal manner. So thank you, Riva, for that question. I hope you were able to hear um, the answer for that. Um, and Brother Sui Hyang, how to be mindful to be proactive during pandemic times. I... I apply these practices of joy um, in this pandemic situation now to remind myself that if happiness is not dependent on the external situation, um, then the pandemic can exist and all the negative effects of the pandemic in the world can go on and they do go on, but I keep a reserve of happiness that I can access when I need it when things get me down, or when things seem too difficult. That has worked for me so far. It gives me a broader picture or a broader context. Like I, I, I think of Auschwitz, where the Jews were being tortured and murdered. And um, there was a doctor called, 
his name escapes me now, but he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And even in the situation of Auschwitz, where his relatives and friends were being tortured, he as a doctor um, made a decision that protected his mental health. He decided to treat Jews and Nazi guards who came to him as a doctor equally without bias. That points to me that he was someone who realized that his happiness, his emotional response was not conditioned by the external situation of being in a concentration camp and being tortured and being abused. But he, he, he discovered that his happiness was within his own control. He decided to be happy or to be calm and to, be, to have loving kindness despite everything. Victor Frankel, thank you, Brother Bobby. Thank you so much. Um, show again the slide with my email. Yep, okay. Um, thank you, Brother Bobby. That was Victor Frankel. Um, so that is an outstanding human example of how happiness, having an independent reservoir of happiness can bring us through difficult times, whether it's pandemic or whether it's a concentration camp. Um, yeah. So I hope that helps. If it didn't, um, feel free to clarify your question and email me and I will try my best to answer it to your satisfaction. Okay, that is all the questions. We have no more questions coming in from the chat. Thank you all very much for practicing together with me today. And thank you very much for your attention and your intentions. Brother Bobby, I'll hand back very late. Sorry.